we are surrounded by many seemingly simple things. But do you know how they're made? In the world, there is a large number of modern enterprises manufacturing various goods that are a part of our everyday life. How do we turn a simple logger plank into a true masterpiece? Let's see how trees of giant proportions are cut and what tools are used to process them. Where chocolate is born, how tires of gigantic size are manufactured, and how giant wind turbines are created. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already to make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Wind energy is one of the most promising industries in the world. To create green electricity worldwide, giant wind turbines are installed. Just a few of these can power a small town, but how are they made? Specialized factories are involved in manufacturing these giant structures. They use steel plates for this purpose. This material is an ideal solution for making wind turbines because steel has high strength, capable of withstanding enormous loads, and is inexpensive. To manufacture the base of the turbine, special machines for rolling steel plates are used. Two cylinders rotate at different speeds, allowing the metal sheet to bend. To make the cylindrical body, the steel sheet needs to be rolled several times. A worker uses special gauges to check the bending angle. A special machine then rolls the metal several times until the required shape is achieved. After this, the sheet is welded. This is just one small section of the turbine base. Dozens of them are needed. A crane lifts and moves each section weighing tens of tons to weld them into a single structure. Since these are gigantic tubes, they need to be welded manually. Note the small person against the backdrop of the turbine base. When the sections are welded together, the welds are cleaned with a grinder. To prevent any rusting, the metal is treated with a special anti-corrosion mixture and painted both on the outside and the inside. There are special holes for attaching the sections at the edges of each such part. Manufacturing the blades is a much more complex process. First, engineers design their shape on a computer. They have a special shape that will ideally catch wind flows. Steel and other metals are not suitable for their manufacture because they would be far too heavy. The blades need to be lightweight and extremely strong to withstand their own weight or strong winds. Fiberglass and various composite metals, such as carbon fibers, are used for their production. They are extremely strong and lightweight. The blade manufacturing process resembles paper mache. Layer by layer, the turbine's base is formed. Epoxy resin is used to bond the layers together. It also adds strength to the structure. This process is almost entirely done manually, so it's important to follow diagrams and blueprints to maintain the aerodynamic properties of the blades. Once the base is ready, it is sanded and painted. All irregularities need to be removed to make the surface perfectly smooth. Note that one blade is as long as the hanger where they are manufactured. Their size is truly impressive. This 107 meter turbine was made for another wind turbine in France. All workers and their families lined up along it. That's 205 people. How tiny they are compared to the construction element. This is just one of three blades made at the factory. The diameter of the assembled wind turbine is approximately 220 meters. Before they leave the production hangar, they must be tested though. Special machines that shake the blades simulating storm gusts of wind are used for this purpose. This helps ensure that the structure is reliable and that there are no weak spots. Thanks to the use of composite materials, the blades bend but don't break and restore their shape. If they were made of metals, they would deform and become unusable within just a few seconds of the test. Such tests can last several hours to ensure that they don't lose any of their strength, as wind turbines are expected to work for decades. To transport wind turbine parts to their destination, large trucks with trailers are required. Before a wind turbine or blade is transported, they are usually disassembled into separate parts that can be transported both safely and efficiently. This reduces the dimensions and weight of each part, making transportation much easier. However, blades cannot be disassembled, so they have to be transported whole. During this process, streets are closed off. Transporting them is quite difficult, especially at turns and road intersections. In urban conditions, this is almost an impossible task. Even on highways, various difficulties may arise, therefore the route is carefully planned. To make a turn and pass one blade through this intersection, it was necessary to block traffic. This must be done slowly and carefully, as the drivers of the main truck and trailer work in harmony to avoid accidents or damage to the structure. The convoy is accompanied by special vehicles with flashing lights, warning other drivers of the danger. To prepare the site for the wind turbine installation, a special trench is dug and soil is compacted. Wind turbines can weigh hundreds of tons, so it's necessary to choose the right location and prepare it well to prevent soil settlement. It is then filled with concrete, forming a monolithic slab. A special frame is also installed. Using giant cranes, each section of the foundation is installed one by one. They are fastened inside. Workers ascend using a special shaft. Next, the power unit itself, which will generate electricity, is installed. Mounts for the blades are installed on top. 
working at such heights is dangerous. Two cranes lift the blades, which are then attached to the rotor. Sometimes the wind turbine is assembled on the ground and then all three blades are lifted up at once to be attached to the generator. This depends technically on the complexity of the work. Would you dare to climb to the top of a wind turbine? This man here is making paper using the traditional Chinese method, just as it was done thousands of years ago. First, he manually collects enough bark from suitable trees. It should be flexible and not too dry. Such bark is easy to peel off from the trunk and roll up. Then the man removes the dry bark and moss with a knife and divides the soft bark into thin strips. This is easy to do by hand, as it tears into fibers. The strips are placed into a special container, and starch, ash, or other substances are added. Everything is poured with water and left to soak so that the bark softens. After a few hours, the water can be drained, and the strips are taken to the river to be thoroughly rinsed. After soaking in hot water, the bark breaks down into fine fibers. They are rinsed again and taken into a special furnace, where the water is heated. The bark is boiled until it darkens and resembles ropes. It is then spread out in the open air to dry. Fibers that were dark brown and soft after boiling become almost snow white and dry. They are collected and taken back to the river. They are moistened and then beaten up with a special tool. This requires quite a bit of effort. The fibers are soaked again in special reagents and placed in the furnace for heating. After this step, they seem to resemble spaghetti. Anything unnecessary is removed by hand, and the bark is ground into a homogeneous mixture using a special homemade machine, just like in ancient times. The mixture, in consistency, resembles dough. It is now placed in a bag and taken back to the river for another rinse. The bag is attached to a stick and swished around in the water. The mixture is transferred to a special tub, where it is finely ground and stirred with sticks. The water should resemble milk. It may take a long time to ensure there are no lumps left. Glue is made from the bark, which resembles maple syrup in appearance and thickness. It is also added to the tub and stirred. On special bamboo mats, the white mixture settles, forming future sheets. They are carefully removed and stacked. The paper is sent under a press with stones to remove excess moisture. The sheets are carefully separated and hung on wooden boards to dry completely. After several days of work, traditional Chinese paper appears. This is how paper of enormous size is made. The same methods are used for small size paper, but here it's impossible without a production facility and dozens of workers. To immerse a special mat into the container, 40 people are needed. They work in harmony. They dip the giant frame into the tub with the mixture several times and then pull it out to let the water drain. When the mat has accumulated enough thickness of sediment, the paper sheet is pulled out for drying. Such sheets of paper are used for creating art installations, huge paintings, and even maps. Wood can be used to create not only furniture, but also entire art installations and sculptures that impress with their scale and expressiveness. This process is quite challenging. From selecting the materials to the final touches of varnishing, every stage of the process requires great attention and a creative approach. When cutting and shaping with a chainsaw, the artist considers not only the desired form, but also the natural properties of the wood, such as texture and internal structure. The carver chose this stump to create a dragon figure. First, he uses a chainsaw to give the wood a rough shape. You can see how the silhouette emerges, the head and torso. The root system is perfect for making claws. Using a grinder allows for the creation of fine details and gives the sculpture smoothness of form. Each stroke adds the necessary contour and details. Rotary tools and hand instruments are also used to refine the sculpture. It's meticulous work. The final touch is the application of varnish. It not only protects against pests and moisture, but also in the moment when the sculpture acquires its individual character and expressiveness. Varnish enhances the texture and colors of the wood, adding depth and shine. Lumberjacks here now are felling another tree of impressive size. To make it fall in the desired direction, they have cut a triangular section of the wood. After this, they start sawing the trunk from the opposite side. It's not always necessary to complete this cut. Under its own weight, the tree gradually begins to tilt in the desired direction. When a crack is heard, it's time to step away to a safe distance until the tree falls. Now we see the work of a pilot named Jed. They cut trees with a helicopter and a huge saw that hangs under it. This is done so that the trees do not interfere with power lines. Pilots do this work for 28 whole days without days off, after which they go on vacation and then come back again. Hanging from an aluminum pipe under the helicopter, a tree saw finds its place. This tube essentially serves as a platform for securely transporting the saw. Driven by a belt, the saw boasts a gas engine that powers it. From inside the helicopter, the pilot has full control over the saw. They have the ability to initiate the apparatus, set the blades in motion, and increase their revolutions per minute. 
In addition, the pilot can adjust the orientation of the saw in relation to the helicopter for precise cutting angles. These are everyone's favorite Coca-Cola bottles, and right now we'll see how they're made. Glass bottles are made by melting a mixture of raw materials, sand, soda ash, limestone, and other additives in a furnace, molding bottles from molten glass in various ways, blowing, trimming excess glass, checking for defects, decorating or labeling, and finally packaging for sale. By the way, do you also like drinking Coca-Cola from glass bottles rather than from plastic ones because the taste changes due to the material? And also comment down below what is cooler, Pepsi or Cola? This roll splitter guillotine shows how to recycle material. This cutter was designed to recycle a wide variety of things. These roll cutter varieties allow users to easily place large rolls of paper, plastic, textile, or any cylindrical material under the blade, facilitating the automatic cutting process. Thermal insulation foam is produced by mixing polymers with additives and blowing agents. This mixture is foamed by injection or extrusion methods. As the foam hardens, it forms a cellular structure. Cured foam is cut and formed, quality tested, and then packaged for sale. Foam is commonly used to provide thermal and sound insulation in buildings, residences, industrial facilities, and various other applications where maintaining temperature control and reducing noise transmission is important. Manufacturing rubber tires for cars is a complex process. Various types of rubber, both synthetic and natural, are used in production. Raw materials such as rubber, carbon black, oil, sulfur, and other additives are mixed together using special machines and drums to create a homogeneous rubber mixture. From this rubber mixture, sheets of the required thickness are produced. These rubber sheets are used to create the tire base and sidewalls. Using special press molds shaped like ring bases, tires of the required size are shaped and formed. For greater reliability and strength, reinforcement is used. A special metal mesh becomes the basis for the future tire. Afterwards, the rubber undergoes vulcanization, which adds maximum strength to it. At the final stage, the tire undergoes quality control, where it is checked for defects, dimensions, thickness, as well as any resistance to pressure and wear. After successful quality control, the tire is ready for packaging and shipment to wear houses and sale to consumers. However, in the production of tires for airplanes, more complex processes and more thorough quality control are used because, well, the lives of hundreds of people depend on airplane tires. Therefore, their production involves many complex technical processes. Aircraft tires are typically manufactured using the same technologies and at the same plants as tires for racing cars. They must be as strong as possible. Although aircraft tires are only used for a few minutes during takeoffs and landings, they are subjected to enormous loads during this time. The first step in making aircraft tires is selecting special materials that meet aviation standards. Typically, high-strength rubbers and special composite materials are used to provide the necessary strength, elasticity, and wear resistance. Special pressures and molds are used to shape the tires. The material mixtures are subjected to high pressure and temperature, allowing them to take on a required shape and structure. Additionally, aircraft tires have a specific thread design that ensures the necessary traction with the runway surface. The tires undergo vulcanization, a process of increasing temperature and pressure that helps create strong chemical bonds in the material structure and increases its resistance to loads and temperature fluctuations. Aircraft tires are rigorously tested and checked using dozens of different tests and special equipment. Mistakes can cost people's health and lives. Therefore, there are many checks and quality controls at such plants. For military jet aircraft, tires need to be even stronger as they must withstand the tremendous temperatures generated during takeoff and landing. Therefore, aviation rubber must withstand extremely high temperatures. The process of manufacturing large tires is similar to that of regular tires, but specific large size machines are used. Similar to regular tires, it's necessary to produce rubber sheets of the required thickness for large tires. These sheets will then be used to form the giant tires. Many processes are carried out manually or under the careful supervision of specialists who manually apply the reinforced base layer and inspect the tire quality. Each new product is checked for defects. It's worth noting that the size of these tires is twice as large as a person examining them. A special mechanism rotates the tire while it's carefully inspected and felt. At one stage of the inspection, the inspector even needs to enter the rotating tire, resembling a hamster wheel. They check the distance between the edges and inspect the internal part using a flashlight. Once the inspection process is complete, a lift transports the tire to the warehouse and prepares it and dozens of others for transportation. Many modern factories use robotic manipulators in the production process. 
These robots handle, cut, and inspect rubber sheets on conveyor lines. However, even here, manual work cannot be avoided. In addition to visual inspection, quality experts use special laboratory equipment to determine tire quality and strength. For large batches, several samples are selected for testing and thorough inspections before they are sent for sale. New giant tires are transported on special trucks. Platforms were designed to securely fix the giant tires in a vertical position. Each platform can carry up to 8 such tires. This method of transportation is more efficient because, well, lying the tires take up more space and occupy a significant portion of the road. This creates danger for other drivers and requires an escort vehicle with flashing lights to warn other drivers of the danger. The new tires are securely fastened with special fasteners. By attaching two additional trailers, one truck can transport up to 24 giant tires weighing tens of tons. This helps reduce transportation costs and lowers the cost of the finished product because such tires often travel thousands of kilometers to their destination. Therefore, it's no wonder that such platforms are used in tire production for dump trucks and other oversized vehicles. The entire route is carefully planned by logistics teams. The tires are loaded onto the platforms using special lifts and securely fastened. When they arrive at the destination, the complex process of installation on trucks, construction, or agricultural machinery begins. This takes a lot of time and requires special equipment. The body of the machine is lifted using powerful hydraulic jacks. The larger and heavier the equipment, the more powerful the jacks need to be. The machines are securely fixed to prevent them from shifting using blocks, and then the air is released from the chamber to remove the wheel and replace it. A new tire is brought on a truck and removed using a crane, as it can weigh several tons. This is quite dangerous as you might imagine, so workers move to a safe distance. If such a tire bursts, it can fly off and cause some serious injuries. Any old ordinary manual tools won't help in removing the old tire. Hydraulic clamps are needed. These are used by rescuers when it's necessary to quickly extract a victim from a car whose doors are blocked due to damage in an accident. This tool helps remove the fasteners and tire. The old tire is dismantled using a lift or crane, and a new one is placed in its place. All fasteners need to be thoroughly cleaned of dirt. All parts are lubricated and put back in place. When the tire is fixed, it can be inflated using a powerful compressor. Although everything looks quite simple and fast in the video, in reality, it takes several hours and requires the work of several people. And now, what should we do with all the old leftover tires after the replacement? Well, they need to be properly disposed of, as they pose some serious environmental problems. Millions of tires end up in huge landfills every year. This pollutes the soil and groundwater, and in case of a fire at the landfill, tires can cause a real catastrophe over large areas. That's why tires have started to be actively recycled, giving them a second life. First, old rubber is cut up with powerful hydraulic guillotines. They can easily handle even large tires for trucks and special vehicles. Cutting machines work like scissors. A tire, like a cake, is sliced into pieces. The mechanism rotates a tire after each new cut. Some machines first cut large tires lengthwise to cut them into smaller pieces. By cutting large tires this way, it is much easier to transport them to specialized plants that recycle old rubber into something new. There is no need to use special vans that can only transport a few tires. By cutting tires, dozens of tons of rubber can be transported for recycling right away. To produce boards from smaller diameter logs, there are also special machines available. The log is fixed onto a conveyor line. Special rollers with teeth slowly feed the wood forwards towards several metal saws that cut up the wood. The blades can be spaced at different distances to obtain boards of varying sizes. This process can take anywhere from mere minutes to up to an hour, depending on the length of the log. But in the end, we get a perfect cut. It's somewhat reminiscent of special bread slicers seen in supermarkets. In the USA, in Tyler County, it was decided to cut down a giant sequoia. It was damaged by a forest fire and the trunk of the tree was severely burnt. So it was decided to remove it. The size of the sequoia is impressive. In diameter, it reached approximately 14 feet. Lumberjacks seemed tiny against its backdrop. To fell the tree, workers began to saw off parts of the trunk with chainsaws. This is not an easy task, as the tree is truly massive. The wood needs to be cut into small pieces. Trying to make a regular cut, the chainsaw blade would simply get stuck under the weight of the trunk. Axes and mallets were used to chip away at the wood. To make sure the trunk fell in the right direction, the tree was gradually cut from the necessary side. Safety ropes were also used during the process, attempting to guide the tree in the desired direction upon falling. Special pneumatic rifles were used to hook the ropes onto branches, firing a rope from them. It took only 10 hours of continuous work over two days to fell the sequoia. The giant tree trunk fell with a lot of noise. It was felled in such a way as to prevent the sequoia from damaging other trees upon falling. 
To create a wooden sculpture on a log, the future silhouette is drawn out first. This master decided to make a bird, so he took a chainsaw in his hand. For everything to succeed, the wood must be of good quality and without voids inside, otherwise the sculpture will not turn out. First, the master forms the rough silhouette of the bird. The wings are the most challenging part. He should carefully carve the feathers so that the wooden bird looks as realistic as possible. After the chainsaw, smaller tools can now be used to add finer detail. The master uses various grinding machines. Depending on the complexity of the work, he chooses either an angle grinder or a belt sander. Eyes and beak can be painted using a drill and special wood attachments. Although everything seems to happen quickly in the video, in reality it can take up to more than a day. The figure now needs to be sanded and coated with varnish. Now it can be adorned in someone's home, garden, or yard. Wooden wheels for carts can still be made today using traditional methods, just like they were crafted back in ancient times. This man from India employs simple hand tools to make a wooden wheel. First, he creates the central hub, drilling holes for the future wooden spokes using hardwoods for strength. He crafts the spokes using axes and chisels, requiring 10 for each wheel, which are then driven into the hub. Glue can be used for extra strength, but it's not always necessary if the assembly is done correctly. The rim is made from wooden arcs, which are attached to the opposite ends of the spokes. Since the crafting is done manually, each step requires careful verification of hole placement, often measured by eye. Holes are then drilled in the arcs, the only modern tool the craftsman uses. To ensure longevity, a metal frame is made from the wooden base. To fit in place, it's heated until red hot and then quickly affixed into the wood. The heat causes the wood to smoke and ignite, so the craftsman has only seconds to complete this step. Once the metal ring is in place, the fire is extinguished with water. A rubber tire is then fitted onto the metal frame. This process is repeated three times and the cart is ready to use again. To fell a tree, you don't necessarily need a chainsaw. Beavers can easily handle this task. These animals gnaw trees to build their nests and dams. They also feed on bark. Often, these creatures become real pests, destroying dozens of trees along waterways. They typically go to work mainly at night. This night vision camera captured a beaver gnawing away on a tree trunk. It does this slowly and gradually. These animals have extremely strong teeth, much stronger than those of humans, and they grow continuously throughout their lives. So even if the animal has enough food or no need to build a dam, they still need to no gnaw on trees to wear down their teeth. This beaver gnaws at the wood in various places and periodically listens for any cracking. When the beaver hears that the tree is about to fall, it quickly starts to flee to a safe place. The man who left the camera was surprised in the morning when he saw the fallen tree. It's hard to believe that in just two or three nights, one small animal can gnaw through a large trunk. The next night, the beaver began to work on the neighboring tree. Therefore, in some areas, efforts are made to trap these animals to prevent them from destroying plantings. Car painting is treated seriously at the factories. All steps are always planned there. First, a car body undergoes a thorough preparation, including cleaning and inspection to remove any contaminants. A primer coat is then applied to create an optimal surface for the paint to adhere to. A base coat containing the selected color is carefully sprayed onto the vehicle body by skilled workers or robotic systems to ensure uniform coverage. And in the end, they're polished and varnished. No, this is not a huge inflatable ball, but plastic in its original form. After this material has been compressed in a special form, it'll turn into a plastic boat or a kayak. Also surprised? But this is exactly how plastic boats are made, which are then used on the water in different situations. A trip along the river, fishing or extreme sports on the rapids. To protect your territory, you always need a fence. And in this video, we can see how mesh fences are made at different factories. At each production, different machines are installed through which meters or wire pass. These machines twist ordinary wire so that a reliable fence comes out as a result. Please, just don't check the quality of this machine for yourself and do not stick your fingers. This is a TS-700 high-speed slicer with an involute blade that slices juicy ham. It's cut at speeds of up to 2,000 RPM and up to 450 millimeters wide. By the way, did you know why jamon is cut into thin slices? This exposes more of the meat's surface to the air, enhancing the release of its complex flavors and aromatic compounds. This is Kuhn RW1610 trailed round bale wrapper designed for professional use where demanding wrapping tasks require superior performance and efficiency. This wrapper is also equipped with a high grip film cutter and a film roll holder. All this is necessary to maintain the quality of the forage, increase its shelf life, and improve digestibility. 
there is a huge assortment of condoms from various manufacturers, ultra thin with specific shapes, textured, glowing in the dark, or even in different colors. However, they are all united by the common principle of manufacturing. Before they reach us, they go through several complex stages of production and testing, which can take up to two weeks. It all starts with preparing a special mixture. Up to 90% of all condoms worldwide are made from latex, and it's no wonder as this material is extremely strong. It's difficult to tear or damage. Moreover, it's hypoallergenic, unlike many other materials that can be used for making condoms. Latex is made from a liquid extracted from rubber trees. It's white and resembles milk. There are entire farms in tropical countries where the base for latex products is extracted. The liquid is collected in a special container. Stabilizing agents are added to prevent the liquid from thickening and loosening its quality. Then, they are poured into large tanks that are shipped to factories around the world. Various compounds are added to the rubber liquid during production to obtain a strong and elastic material. Specialists in laboratories study the properties of the base and accurately calculate the amount of other components. This is a responsible process. The quality of the entire batch depends on it. If a mistake is made in preparing the mixture, the finished condoms won't pass the strength and quality tests, so the entire batch will be sent for disposal. First, a small trial batch is prepared, which is thoroughly checked. Only after that can a full-scale mixture be prepared into an industrial scale. The finished mixture is left in huge containers for a week to stabilize and acquire the necessary properties. During this time, all the air is released from the mixture. If it's used without waiting for a few days, the finished product won't be strong due to its microscopic holes formed by small air bubbles that haven't had time to escape. Special temperature is maintained in the containers during this time. When the mixture is ready, it's checked again and transported to the production line. Pay attention to the molds dipped into the latex mixture reservoir. Glass bulbs have the size and shape of the finished product. Some have a textured surface or a specific shape. The length of the dipping machine line is approximately 30 meters. Each bulb can be dipped in latex several times. The thickness of the condoms depends on this. So, when you see the ultra-thin mark on the packaging, you'll know how they are made. After each dipping, as it moves along the conveyor, the layer of latex has time to dry. When the required number of dips is done, the line goes to a special oven for vulcanizing the latex. This helps give the material strength. If this isn't done, the condom can be easily torn by hand without much effort. However, after vulcanization, it will be difficult to damage the latex with hands or even a sharp knife. When drying is complete, the condoms need to be removed from the bulb. This is done using a water flow. They are collected in a special container. To prevent the rubber from sticking together, they need to be rinsed and coated with talcum powder. Starch mixture is often used for this purpose. This is done in special machines resembling large washing machines. In them, condoms are also cleared from possible chemical residues of production and sterilized to prevent any microfibers on the surface. After such washing, they are left for several days to fully stabilize. Then comes the important stage. Testing. It's necessary to ensure the quality of the finished products. There are many different methods for this. Condoms are inflated using a compressor to enormous sizes until they burst. This helps ensure their strength and absence of weak spots that could cause tearing. Pay attention to the large sizes the condoms can be inflated to before bursting. According to international standards, safe condoms should withstand 18 liters of air. However, quality products can easily withstand up to 30 liters of air. All indicators are recorded by a special computer system, which determines the load and pressure inside. Several condoms from the batch are filled with water to check for leaks. This test can be done manually or with special machines. It's important to make sure that not a single drop of water can seep out. These condoms won't be sent to the packaging line anymore, but they help ensure that everything was done correctly and the rest of the batch has the same high quality. Random samples in the laboratory are also tested using various tests, from the strength of the cross-section to examining the structure under powerful microscopes. But if only a few condoms from the entire batch are selected for air and water testing, all products are checked on the next machine. Condoms are manually stretched over stainless steel bases, and electric current passes through them. Latex is a good dielectric that doesn't conduct electricity. A special brush checks each condom. If it detects electrical voltage, it means there's a hole. This process is similar to washing a car at a car wash. Defective condoms are automatically removed from the line and will be disposed of. This check helps ensure that no substandard products reach consumers. Usually, the packaging indicates that each condom has been checked for defects. Finally, condoms are coated with a special layer of lubricant on a silicone or water base. It's needed not only for comfortable use, but also for long-term preservation of the latex quality. A special machine rolls up the condom and sends it to the sorting and distribution line. Condoms move along the conveyor where a robotic arm places them. In small factories, this is done manually by a person who places condoms in special niches. They move to the packaging lines. The quality of the product and its shelf life also depend on the packaging. The packaging must be completely airtight, because contact with the air over a long period of time deteriorates the quality of the latex, causing it to lose its initial elasticity and 
added strength. It is for this reason each individual package has a polyethylene layer that hermetically seals each condom. The second layer of packaging is made of foil material. It helps protect the latex from sunlight, which also negatively affects the material over time. Condoms are sealed in the package and cut with a special guillotine. Finally, they can be packed into boxes. In large enterprises, this is done by a machine, while in small factories, the task is entrusted to packagers who place the necessary quantity of condoms and usage instructions in the box. At the final stage, the packed boxes are wrapped in film for additional protection and packed into large boxes. After this, the condoms are ready for delivery to pharmacies and stores. Felling a giant tree in a desired direction is quite a complex process. Everything needs to be done correctly. The trunk of the tree is cut from one side. To start tilting it, a special wedge is driven into the cut. A small wedge is enough to tilt the tree just a few degrees in the desired direction. This is usually sufficient for the tree to fall in the intended direction. When the lumberjack sees that everything is going according to plan and the trunk begins to tilt, they release the chainsaw, which was trapped during cutting, and step away. In a moment, the trunk, weighing several tens of tons, falls to the ground. Then it can be cut up into smaller logs. From wooden planks and epoxy resin, you can create unique designer tables. This man used two planks. With the help of burning and special tools, he can give the surface the desired texture. Epoxy resin is mixed with dye and poured for the first layer. When it solidifies, decorative moss and stones are placed on it, after which another layer of epoxy resin is poured. Next, the table is sanded to remove any irregularities and polished to shine. The craftsman burns his logo into the wooden part of the table. Metal legs are attached to the tabletop. They are sanded and coated with a layer of lacquer for shine. LED lighting is attached to the bottom. Would you like such a table? Write it down in the comments below! A fascinating idea for a designer table. On the wooden base, the master marks curves. Using a grinding machine, he begins to cut out indentations of various sizes. The grinding machine helps smooth out all the irregularities, resulting in a lot of dust and wood rot. Making such a table is not easy, because there are many details. Its surface resembles a sandy desert or soft fabric rather than hard wood. By putting in a lot of effort, a wave-like surface is achieved. The surface is then coated with a special lacquer. But using such a table may not be very convenient. Due to the wavy design, Special mounts were installed in its corners on which a glass tabletop can be placed for comfortable use. A great solution for your own home or office. Such tables are significantly more expensive, but many people are willing to spend a lot of money to have unique designer furniture in their homes that will amaze guests. The same master not only makes designer tables, but also proves that wood can be used to create true works of art, not just practical items. The master decided to make a decoration from wood in a similar technique that could be hung on the wall. He again marks the block of wood. If you have any good imagination, you can create truly impressive things. The man begins to cut away wavy shapes. During the work, he changes the attachments on the grinding machine several times to achieve different shapes. Sawdust flies in different directions. It wouldn't hurt to protect your eyes with special goggles, but the master knows what he's doing. He checks with his hand whether the surface is perfectly smooth and blows everything away with a stream of air. To obtain an unusual color, the the wood is charred in the necessary places. The process is reminiscent of painting a picture. The artwork is coated with a layer of lacquer, resulting in a wonderful installation that perfectly complements the room's interior. If you ever wanted to experience what it's like to be a lumberjack climbing a tall tree, this video is for you. It shows the process of gradually cutting down a tall tree. The worker has secured himself at the top of the trunk and carefully saws the tree with a chainsaw. Special harnesses and small platforms attached to the trunk help you to stand securely at the height, even with several safety ropes. It's quite dangerous, even with safety measures in place. Choosing the right position is crucial to ensure that the log falls in the opposite direction and doesn't injure the worker. Many people suffer serious injuries during such work, so safety precautions shouldn't be overlooked, especially at heights of over 20 meters. It's also important to be careful not to injure oneself with a chainsaw while holding it with one hand in such a position. One must also ensure not to accidentally damage the safety rope. When the cut is sufficient, a lumberjack pushes the log over with one hand, and it falls right on down. Would you dare to take on such work? Share your thoughts down in the comments below! Making an unconventional and useful item out of wood is certainly a crafty endeavor. Take for instance a convenient organizer. A craftsman constructed the base from wooden planks, connecting it with three circles. Using a pneumatic gun, he securely fastens the main elements together. In the sections formed, various elements can be installed to create spaces for storing various small items. 
These wooden elements are glued together using special adhesive. Curved wooden borders are installed onto the base, and a special mechanism is inserted into the bottom to allow the structure to rotate conveniently. At the top, a hook is attached for hanging the organizer when needed. Finally, it needs to be varnished. Just look at how the color of the wood changes afterwards. Now, the organizer can be used for storing various tools. It's a great addition to any garage or workshop and looks much better than a plastic case. Do you also like eating sweets while watching a movie? And now, look at how they do what you will later use with pleasure. A special machine is visible on the screens, which stirs the already caramelized mixture. Flavors such as vanilla extract or other natural and artificial flavor compounds are added at this stage. The mixture is agitated to ensure an even distribution of flavors. When I saw this for the first time, I was surprised because I didn't know about this method of repairing pipes. This is how bad or broken pipes are repaired. They are filled with filler material mixed with epoxy resin. When it hardens, a new layer appears inside the pipe. You may be wondering why they do it. There are a couple of reasons for this. First, it speeds up the recycling process. Hydraulic presses are commonly used in scrap yards to press old vehicles into smaller, more manageable parts. This process aids in recycling by reducing the volume of the vehicle and preparing it for further recycling. Also, recycling old cars using hydraulic pressing reduces the need for new raw materials and reduces energy consumption compared to the production of brand new cars. Just watch the compression process for a few minutes and you'll realize that you have been stuck on this video for several hours. Here is a real transformer tunnel cleaner. It's certainly not a bumblebee, but it's not bad either. Manufactured by Colas, renowned for its expertise in road construction, this tunnel cleaning truck takes inspiration from car washes. It ingeniously transforms the concept of car washing to effectively disinfect tunnels. In accordance with the principles of environmental care, this truck uses water without detergents. Surprisingly versatile, it can be quickly folded in just five minutes for faster ground clearance. In addition, its adaptability allows for smooth navigation through various tunnel configurations. This is a crusher with a very pathetic name, Shredder. Different sorts of metal are thrown into it, and not only so that it soften and crush it. The device is so powerful that it breaks even the most durable metals. The craftsmen embark on making another sculpture from a tree trunk. The log was so large and heavy that he managed to lift it with the help of a special elevator. He measured the required length of the log and cut it with a chainsaw. The master marks lines to make it easier to trim away the excess wood. He shapes the future head from the top. At the initial stage of carving the sculpture, he performs rough shaping. Gradually, using the chainsaw, he cuts out the future silhouette. Can you guess who this man wants to make? Write it down in the comments first. At first, the head becomes visible. Now we can outline the torso for cutting. This requires considerable experience and a good imagination. Some masters work with wood directly, without any drawings, but this requires considerable experience. So, to ensure the sculpture turns out as you envisioned, it's better to make a sketch. You probably already guessed that the man decided to make a sculpture of a bear. He carefully carves the arms and legs, small cuts can mimic fur, and after this, the figure is sanded and burned with a gas torch. To make the sculpture more realistic, a part of the nose is left unburned. The main thing is to not overdo it to avoid burning the sculpture. Using fire, you can achieve a dark color of the wood without paint or lacquer. From a plank, he cuts out a sign, welcome, for the bear to hold and greet guests. A wonderful sculpture for a home or restaurant entrance. What a great idea to make a cup out of bamboo. Using a saw, you need to cut a section of the stem to the appropriate height. It's important to remove the green part and sand the base well. You'll also need a special piece of bamboo for the handle. It also needs to be cleaned and sanded well. Small holes are cut into the base into which the handle can be inserted. By securely attaching the handle, a great and environmentally friendly cup is created. It can be made in less than an hour with a minimal set of tools. When it's necessary to cut down a tree growing in a yard, it should be done carefully and gradually to avoid damaging anything when it falls. So, first all the branches need to be cut, leaving just the bare trunk. Such a tall tree needs to be sawn from the top down. For this, the lumberjack climbs up to the safety ropes and using a chainsaw cuts the trunk into small logs. The cut should be made slowly, without rushing, to ensure that the log doesn't fall prematurely. Each piece is secured with a rope to prevent it from falling from a great height. When the stump barely holds on, the workers can push the remaining part of the trunk by hand or pull it with a rope while staying down below. This is the most dangerous moment. Notice how the log swings down and around the trunk and almost
force hits the worker. A blow like this can knock someone off their feet, or the log or its fragments can severely injure a person. Then the log is slowly lowered using a rope. The lumberjack descends lower, and the process is repeated until the trunk is cut into small pieces. This is how you can make a round recess in a wooden block. You'll need a circular saw and a bit of effort. Fix the block in the center so that it can be rotated around one point. Begin forming the recess with cuts. This is the simplest and quickest way to make a perfect recess. This method can be used to create a great stand for a favorite ball, a bowling ball, or any other round object. To transplant a tree from one location to another, there are special machines for uprooting. They are suitable only for trees of certain sizes and types though. A special mechanism captures the trunk in a ring. Several mechanical teeth enter the ground, acting like shovels. This allows for the plant to be dug up from all sides and pulled out of the soil, causing minimal damage to the root system, as the soil and small roots around it need not be pulled out too. After this, the tree can be transported and planted in a prepared pit. Some mechanisms also dig around the tree to easily lift it from the ground. This is done by a mechanism resembling a saw. Such equipment is used in forestry when it is necessary to transplant a suitable tree to the desired location. From a wooden block, one can create wheels for a toy car or a souvenir. To do this, the plank is mounted on a lath and given a perfectly round shape. Afterward, a hole is carved inside, similar to a real tire. Using a drill, the surface is then patterned to mimic tire treads. Due to the friction, the wood may begin to smoke, so speed is essential. This process is repeated three more times before moving on to the discs. These can be crafted using hand tools. The craftsman carves out all the intricate details before assembling the pieces, adding a coat of lacquer for a finishing touch, resulting in excellent wheels. To cut down trees of regular size, special equipment is used. These are logging tractors with attached machinery. The machine can enter the forest in search of the desired tree. A special mechanism securely fastens the trunk, and a saw cuts it near the base. After that, using rollers, the bark and small branches are stripped away as if with a razor. The trunk can then be cut into logs of the required length. This process takes less than a minute, whereas doing it manually would take hours, even with powerful chainsaws. Some machines first cut the tree near the base, and then the mechanism grabs the tree before it begins to fall. This equipment is used to quickly clear the forest of damaged and dry trees, as well as to perform timber harvesting tasks. Chocolate. It's not just delicious treats, but a complex product. There are thousands of varieties of this dessert, from classic chocolate bars to candies with different fillings. This dessert is loved all over the world. Have you ever wondered though how it's made? Real tasty chocolate is made from quality cocoa beans. The basis for our favorite chocolates is mainly born in African countries, such as Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Nearly 70% of all cocoa beans used in confectionery production come from these four countries. Cocoa beans grow on special plantations. Dozens of workers ensure that the cocoa seedlings have enough water and are protected from pests. Periodically, the pods are cut and the beans are carefully extracted to determine their ripeness. To avoid damaging the beans, the pods are tapped with a special shovel before being carefully cut open. Since the trees are grown in the tropics, where the climate hardly changes throughout the year, the beans are harvested several times a year because the fruits ripen unevenly. So there is always work on the plantation. Most of the processes are done manually. When the pods are sufficiently ripe, they're harvested, and the beans are carefully extracted to avoid damaging them. All the beans that are not ripe enough or have begun to sprout are rejected. They shouldn't end up with the rest. Quality chocolate can only be made from quality and selected beans. If you taste raw cocoa beans, their taste will pleasantly surprise you. They are bitter and astringent and don't resemble the taste of the candies we're used to. Some varieties have a sour taste. To get a pleasant taste, they need to be processed correctly. Cocoa beans are set aside for fermentation. Here's what it looks like on most plantations. Large boxes are filled with collected beans and covered with banana leaves and bags to maintain temperature. This is how fermentation begins. During this process, natural sugars in the beans turn into acid, which helps develop the characteristic taste and aroma of chocolate. From time to time, a specialist mixes the beans and aerates them. When the beans are loaded into boxes, they have more of a fruity smell. During fermentation, this smell changes to an alcoholic one, and then it resembles the smell of vinegar. It's important to not over-ferment the beans as they can start to rot, so specialists check from time to time. To stop the fermentation process, the beans need to be well dried. They are spread out in the sun and periodically raked. Special drying machines can also be used, but they are only available on modern plantations. Moreover, even there, the beans are first dried in the sun and only then sent to a special machine. After the beans have lost the necessary amount of moisture, they can be packed in bags and sent to chocolate factories. They are delivered by trucks to ports or airports to be shipped around the world by ships and planes. 
At the factories, bags of beans are unpacked and samples are taken to the laboratory to determine the quality and select the best recipe for the future dessert. The beans need to be roasted and cleaned. They will then be loaded into a grinding machine. The beans are ground to become a liquid. This yields two main components, cocoa butter and cocoa powder. Cocoa butter must be aged for several weeks. This significantly affects the taste of the product. And the third essential opponent of quality chocolate is sugar. Other ingredients can also be added in various proportions. For example, for a delicate and less bitter taste, milk or special substitutes are added. This is how milk chocolate is made. But which type of chocolate do you prefer? Dark or milk? Let us know down in the comments. To prevent a candy or chocolate from melting immediately in your hands, the chocolate mass needs to be tempered. Chocolate is cooled at a certain temperature and then reheated. This is necessary to stabilize the cocoa butter crystals and maintain the shiny texture and structure of the chocolate. Depending on the recipe, other components, stabilizers, and fillers are added. At large factories, the entire process is automated. The chocolate mass is poured into molds, and after that, they pass through a cooling system, which allows the product to solidify quickly. Often, large trays with molds are taken to large refrigerated rooms to expedite the process. And when the chocolate hardens, automated lines package the sweets. Quality control is then carried out at every stage of production. In addition to visual inspection, the products are weighed, tested, and tasted. Automated monitoring systems help detect any deviations. In small confection areas, everything is done not by a machine, but by a person. The principle remains the same, but everything needs to be done manually. In such workshops, there are usually several people working. Each has their own responsible mission for preparing a base to forming candies. Decorating is quite a meticulous work, but the result is well worth it. Just look at the handmade candies that come out. Confectioners use a special bag to form decorative chocolate elements on the candies. After this, the chocolate must fully solidify. This is something that may take several hours. They are placed in refrigerators to harden, but it's important to not do this too quickly so that the chocolate doesn't crack and lose its appearance. The finished products are sent for packaging. The candies are either wrapped on a special conveyor or manually packed into boxes or paper envelopes. After that, they go to the shelf of stores and confectionery counters. Here we see how latex gloves are made. They are produced in several stages. It begins with the collection of natural latex from rubber trees, followed by coagulation to separate it into rubber and whey. The hand-shaped molds are then dipped layer by layer into the liquid latex, creating the shape of a glove. Vulcanization involves heating the gloves, which increases their strength and flexibility. To remove any residual substances, the gloves are leached and laundered. After drying, each glove goes through a quality control to ensure it meets size, thickness, and general quality standards. Depending on the type of a glove, a layer of powder or polymer coating may be added for ease of use. In general, this machine was created specifically for trimming the roadway, power lines, and power lines lighting. But we see how she trims the trees very beautifully, creating nice forms of branch growth. It greatly decorates ordinary residential streets. Also, the advantage of this mechanism is that it does not need a huge manpower. It's enough to put one person in the cab who will do a quality job in a few hours, instead of hiring dozens of people who will manually trim the trees. Forged steel wheels serve a variety of purposes, primarily in the automotive and industrial sectors. The forging process gives them durability and strength, allowing these wheels to withstand heavy loads and even terrain and challenging environmental conditions. Forging steel wheels involves heating cylindrical refined steel blanks, forming them in a press to give the original shape of the wheel, followed by further refining by rolling. How often do you make delicious pasta? Now watch how your favorite pasta is made for it. The mixture is run through a special roller, which is cut into such pasta. Then they're sorted and sent to shelves in the store. Technology helps everywhere, even in the fields where your favorite berries, fruits, and vegetables grow. And now Argeals has created a self-propelled machine that collects watermelons and melons. It drives between the beds while the desired fruit is thrown into it. Then it delivers the watermelons to another group of people who store the fruit in a trailer. This greatly simplifies the work of people who will no longer suffer from back and arm pain. This machine is used to create perfectly smooth cylinders from wooden blocks. Operating on the principle of lath, the machine securely holds the block from both sides. A special motor starts rotating it at a high speed. Meanwhile, a blade slowly moves along a special rail, cutting away the excess wood and forming a cylindrical shape. 
sawdust flies in all directions, so it's better to wear eye protective goggles and respirators, although these workers often neglect their safety. Eventually, what emerges are round beams that can be used as piles, furniture parts, or in construction. This machine is used to process the trunks of fallen trees, making them convenient for transportation in trucks and trains. A special excavator grabs the trunks with its claws and places them into the wood processing machine. It removes all the unnecessary parts, such as dry bark and remaining branches. An automatic chainsaw cuts the trunk up into pieces of the required length, significantly speeding up the work. Doing this manually would take many hours, but this equipment allows the heavy work to be completed in just a few minutes. Some machines can process multiple trunks at once, cutting off branches and sawing them into pieces. Besides being used in forestry, similar technology is employed in construction, furniture manufacturing, and timber harvesting facilities. It enables quick and efficient wood processing, after which it can be loaded and transported to its destination or undergo further processing. This massive mahogany tree was cut down by several lumberjacks using chainsaws and sent to production. Mahogany wood is highly valued. It is used to make expensive furniture and decorative items. It was delivered to the factory where it was cut up into smaller pieces using large chainsaws. With the help of a lift, it was transported to a special machine where it was sliced into thin discs, several centimeters thick. To prevent the wood from overheating during cutting, it is watered. Markings in the form of circles were made on each disc, and they were cut into smaller pieces manually using a circular saw. Each piece was clamped into a special fixture and cut into a circle using a router. This is not an easy or pleasant job. Just look at the efforts this man puts in. Moreover, he has to be wet and covered in sawdust because the wood is watered to prevent it from overheating and being damaged by friction marks. Afterwards, they were sanded to make them perfectly smooth. Thus, a beautiful kitchen cutting board was made. Just look at how strong the mahogany wood is. It doesn't get scratched by a knife, so it can be used for cutting meat. Even blows from a hammer cannot leave dents. Would you like such a cutting board for your kitchen? Let me know down in the comments. To convert a large log into boards, a special semi-automatic machine is used. First, the log is secured. The mechanism with the saw begins to trim the wood. Since the law is quite large, the machine can't really reach all areas, so excess wood has to be removed with the chainsaw. A special mechanism gradually rotates the log until the unevenness is removed. After this, the boards can be cut. The operator sets the required thickness and the machine starts cutting the log. After some time, a smooth wooden block remains, yielding many boards. Such material is particularly valuable. It is used to make various furniture or in construction. Each board then needs to be sanded. They are passed through a special machine for this purpose. Moving the boards has to be done manually, so it is quite heavy work. The finished material, however, is stacked and left for some time to allow the wood to naturally lose moisture and prevent deformation. With the help of electrical current, the craftsman plans to create an unusual masterpiece from this board. To achieve high conductivity, the surface is moistened with water and a high current is passed through it. It burns the wood, creating indentations. The burn patterns resemble wood grain or algae. Epoxy resin is mixed with blue dye and applied to the surface. Excess resin is then removed and when it fully hardens, the surface is sanded and polished to make it perfectly smooth. Look at the fantastic lightning-like patterns that have been achieved. The outlines burned by the current are noticeable at the edges. This board can be used as a fully-fledged decorative element by hanging it up on the wall. It can also be used as a tray or a stand. This man is engaged in furniture making. To avoid buying planks and boards every time, he decided to purchase a special machine and now makes them himself. All he needs is a high quality log and a little effort to trim away the excess, shape the wooden beam, and cut it up into boards of the required thickness. Not all wood is perfect. In the trunk of this tree, there was a huge colony of ants. This part is unusable due to the voids, so it is simply cut off with a chainsaw. The rest of the log, however, is perfect, so it can be cut up into boards. The main thing is to not forget about personal safety and to protect your ears. The sound during sawing is not pleasant, so it's worth wearing good headphones. From this tree stump, they decided to make a dragon sculpture. It weighs several tons, so special equipment is needed to lift it. They cut it in half, they start forming the contours from the suitable part, they cut off everything unnecessary. This process is similar to slicing a cake. For the craftsman, it is as easy as cutting butter, although in reality, a lot of effort is required for such work. The head and torso of the future dragon are already visible. Several people work on creating the sculpture simultaneously. They use grinding machines to carve out the details. A small drill can create indentations and very 
various contours. All irregularities and jagged edges need to be carefully smoothed out to ensure the surface is even and pleasant to the touch. It's easier to carve the dragon's scales by hand using chisels and hammers. These are hundreds of small details that are carefully carved under the wooden dragon's body. With the help of a chisel, hemispheres can be made. The sculpture is coated with lacquer. To make it multicolored, different types of lacquer are used. For example, transparent lacquer is used for the whiskers and mane, while a darker yellow is used for the body. Just look at the detailed composition that has been achieved. There are even several small dragons around the large one. What impressed you the most in this video? Go ahead and write it down in the comments section below. And don't forget to support us with a like and share this video with your friends. See you guys in the next videos.